there is a reciprocal blogging website known as Tumblr that allows its users to tailor their individual pages to whatever they like. With the exception of certain subjects, users can choose to focus the entirety of their pages to almost anything. There is a Tumblr called Nouvelle Nouveau that is devoted to high fashion, works of modern art, the frailty of desire, the juxtaposition of privacy in an increasingly public world, the complete and total suffering of existence, and what it means to be a person living in the 21st century. If that array of themes seems dizzying, well, it should, because Tumblr is nothing if not representative of the tangled nature of humanity. Nobody is ever just one thing. There are more than 350 million individual Tumblrs, and all are different, in much the same way that every person is different. The name of the unique and uniquely complicated individual that created Nouvelle Nouveau is Elisa Lam. This is the story of how she went missing in Los Angeles in 2013, and how she was found once again, but in a way that nobody could have possibly anticipated. My name is Luis Lopez. Welcome to the City of Sunsets. Our second episode begins in a place that has had a troubled political history, Hong Kong. Alternately governed by China for more than a thousand years, and then by Great Britain in the late 1800s, and then by China again, Hong Kong has rarely, if ever, been a truly independent place. This is despite the fact that the people of Hong Kong speak a different dialect of Chinese and have their own distinct culture. That kind of tumultuous existence will engender a sense of unease in a citizenry who, like the rest of us, just want to be free. It's easy to imagine that this political unrest is why Elisa's parents, David and Yena Lam, left Hong Kong, but the actual reasons may be much more practical. After all, why does anyone emigrate from somewhere they know to somewhere they don't? Most likely, the couple sought financial opportunity, security of welfare, and the chance, however remote, to build a better life. Taking a monumental risk, they traveled over 6,000 miles to Canada and invested all their hopes for the future in a restaurant. David and Yuna Lam opened Paul's restaurant in Burnaby, a coastal city on the eastern edge of Canada. Burnaby is roughly a tenth the size of Hong Kong, but with proportionally much less people. If Hong Kong was overwhelming, then Burnaby was downright cozy. Paul's Restaurant serves typical Western-influenced Chinese food, such as sweet and sour pork, or Kung Pao chicken, but it also serves less traditionally Chinese foods, like fried fish filet with creamed corn, or chicken nuggets and french fries. It seems that Paul's Restaurant has had different owners over the years since it was opened, but while David and Yena Lam managed it, they also managed to have a daughter. Elisa Lam was born on Tuesday, April 30th, 1991. Not much is publicly known about her early life or personal history, but with the events surrounding her being somewhat recent, that's probably a good thing. It's reasonable to speculate, however, that she would experience many of the same things any young woman growing up in modern Western society would. Elisa likely had a childhood similar to yours, or mine. She grew up, and learned, and struggled at times, and ultimately hoped to find her place in the world. A lot has been said about her state of mind, and we will get into that, but I want to stress that more similarities than differences could be drawn between yourself and Elisa. What would end up happening could have happened to anyone, especially in a place as unforgiving as the section of Los Angeles known as Skid Row. In the very heart of downtown LA, Skid Row seems a cartographic pockmark surrounded by pleasantly named places like Pico Gardens, the Fashion District, and Aliso Village. Mostly ephemeral since the late 1800s, Skid Row served as a hub for transients, migrant workers, and those just passing through on their way to somewhere else. That sort of fluctuating populace does not make a place dangerous on its own, but it attracts the kinds of businesses and services that cater to the needs of a temporary workforce, largely male, which only exacerbates the problem of impermanence. You can't expect someone to lay down roots in a place, to value it, if they are always moving on. 
Donald Spivak, former chief of operations of the Community Redevelopment Agency of L.A., knew this dilemma when he wrote, After the arrival of the railroads, the area began to industrialize with an emphasis on agriculture, which is seasonal in nature and therefore includes influxes of short-term workers, especially at planting and harvesting season. He continues, as a result, many small hotels were developed in the 1880 to 1930 era to serve this worker population. Since many of the migrant workers were single and male, this area also saw a proliferation of bars, whorehouses, and other houses of ill repute. One of the establishments that went up during this period was the Hotel Cecil. William Banks Hanner was a wealthy businessman and hotel manager who built the Hotel Cecil in 1924. Intending the hotel to be a destination for traveling businessmen and tourists, Hanner funded and oversaw the construction of an impressive 700 rooms within the Cecil's walls, as well as a grand marble lobby, complete with alabaster statuary. Astonishing both in scope and location, Hanner built the Cecil Hotel oblivious to the oncoming crisis known as Black Tuesday. You may also know that day... October 29, 1929, as the day the stock market crashed, ultimately leading to the Great Depression. At a passing glance, the picket fences found along Hewitt Street in 1932 might invoke the so-called American Dream, but in actuality they were indicative of nothing of the sort. You see, in Depression-era Los Angeles, Hewitt Street was largely a slum, and these worn fences were uneven, soiled encircling ramshackle dwellings filled beyond capacity with those left listless and without work. Neighboring Skid Row to the east, Hewitt Street was a dusty, crumbling wasteland in the 30s. At that time, Los Angeles was already a city of two million people, and that number has only swelled. Though arguably more colorful these days, it was clearly difficult for Hewitt Street and the general area to endure the ravages of the Great Depression. But endure it did. Hewitt Street, Skid Row, Los Angeles adapted as it always will. It speaks to the Angelino state of mind that areas like Skid Row seem to survive, despite the general public disdain for them. And in particular, the Cecil Hotel survived more than its fair share of setbacks and infamy. Just on a personal note, the more I look into the past of the Cecil Hotel, the more I think it may be deserving of its own full episode one day. Few places have seen the kind of darkness that the Cecil had grown accustomed to, and even fewer places are able to utilize that darkness as a tourist attractant. Like I said, maybe one day. It's also worth noting that most online articles that speak of the early business history of the Cecil Hotel seem to stem from a single article posted to Condé Nast Traveler, a website done in the article buckshot style so common these days. I don't understand why anyone would choose to design their website in such a clusterfuck manner. As of this writing, the front page is a seemingly endless scroll of articles and trending topics, looping one aimlessly round and round a mental globe. And while the endless scroll is something that can work well for Tumblr, the same effect does not translate for Condé Nast Traveler. It all becomes a torrential vomit of buzzword titles, littering the almost never-ending front page, absolutely begging you to click them, which you do, and then you feel intellectually guilty for having given in so easily, which you should. Regardless of my feelings on the matter, Condé Nast Traveler reports on travel destinations and the kind of things that can be done there. The article I was referring to, before I hopped onto my high horse and rode off into just the douchiest of sunsets, was written anonymously by someone at the keyboard of details.com, a website that, in their own contributor page, seeks to, quote, embody the new masculine ideal. I had no clue that the new masculine ideal meant stripping human writers of the credit they deserve for journalism, and, by extension, also removing all accountability. Because that's the whole reason I bring up the Condé Nast article at all. Given that it's written anonymously, and thus we have no author to talk to, I cannot guarantee the cogency of anything contained within. It doesn't seem to be a clickbait article of dubious validity, but who knows? For the purposes of this podcast, I choose to believe. At the very least, it makes for an interesting narrative. And isn't that the whole reason why you're here? The article goes on to state that as the Great Depression continued to hamstring Los Angeles, there were as many as 10,000 homeless people living within a four-mile radius of the hotel. 
It must have been obvious to William Banks Hanner that the Cecil Hotel needed to adapt to the difficulties of the time, or it would not survive. As such, he began to move the hotel away from his initial goal of it being a vacation destination, and the Cecil's many rooms were gradually transformed into single-room occupancy housing for transients. And yet, astonishingly enough, those past residents are some of the least scandalous that the Cecil Hotel has had. I don't want to go into too much detail on the matter in this episode, but just for context, the Cecil has played home to no less than two prolific serial killers. Richard Ramirez, also known as the Night Stalker, and Jack Unterweger, whose crimes include strangling women with their own bras. But, like I said, we'll save those monsters for the Cecil-centric episode, which may or may not come, I don't know, we'll see. As time went on, the horrific past of the Cecil Hotel gave it a sort of infamy that may not have always been a bad thing from a business standpoint. Some people are just fascinated by that kind of dark notoriety, myself included. You may know us as murderinos. Make no mistake, it's not that we like the idea of murder. It's that we can't merely ignore it. Now, it would be a bit of a stretch to claim that Elisa Lam was likewise fascinated by the more profane aspects of life, but she certainly contended with the agonizing notions of humanity, societal darkness, and the meaning of existence. At least, she did on her Tumblr. On a page of Nouvelle Nouveau labeled Ultra, which my feeble Western tongue cannot pronounce, Elisa wrote, I don't know how to explain myself, and I have a feeling that I never will know who I am, so instead of an abstract and useless description, I will assure you that I am not a nut job that hunts for the next victim on the internet. The cynicism is quite clear, and not at all unjustified these days, but Elisa also identifies herself as a 20-something student in Canada. She goes on to say that she has typical 20-something issues, specifically bipolar depression. There's a disarming openness in those stark words, the bold-faced gallows humor in places where others might turn away, the complex desire for typicality. That is the Elisa Lam I have come to understand. Within her little pocket of the internet, Elisa writes openly and honestly about living with crippling mental health issues and anyone can click on Nouvelle Nouveau and find some troubled part of themselves reflected in her words. Another entry reads, I have no filter, little self-control, and that's something I have to work on. I don't tone it down when I meet someone new either, so it's just getting slapped with too much at once, and that's not a very good way of introducing yourself. It's just... <sighs> to be so self-confident in my opinions, and yet so critical and aware of my own faults. What a mask. What an act. What a fraud. It is tiring to work with people. It's bad when my brain works overtime. This was an ad hominem entry of Elisa's own life. Nouvelle Nouveau mostly consisted of reposts from other pages, artwork, experimental fashion, TV show gift sets, relatable text posts, things like that. Those reblogs represented what Elisa was feeling at the time, running the gamut from startlingly upbeat to deeply entrenched in sorrow. However, Elisa occasionally peppered her Tumblr with personal entries. This one in particular showed her juggling concepts of self-justification, racial intolerance, and the dangers of overgeneralization. Yet at the same time, Elisa could be critically hesitant, almost to the point of self-destruction. In the same post, she writes, my mouth is my downfall, and it will get me in trouble. I already do so many stupid things. I have troubles knowing where the boundaries are, and it seems I always make the biggest mistakes at the worst possible moments. She opened up about herself online, in a way that isn't always easy to do with another person. In the hashtags of another post, which are exceptionally easy to overlook, Elisa writes, I called a suicide hotline, and spoke for two hours, I think. I'm glad they exist. The freeing obscurity of the internet may have given Elisa a little room to breathe, a bravery she might not have felt in her day-to-day -day life. It would certainly take some bravery for her to plan a surprise trip to the United States, despite her at times incapacitating fears and anxieties. Before leaving Canada, Elisa Lam organized a Bon Voyage Soiree and wrote on her Tumblr, I had a catch-up reunion 
and I'm fatigued, exhausted, and recovery for throwing it and just seeing so many people and doing so many stupid idiotic things in the last four days. She continued, Life is long and difficult and people will always be stupid and complain, but it is worth it so long as you have special moments. Thank you, friends, family, and Tumblr. On January 7th, 2013, she would confirm the details of her trip, writing, I just got my flight booked. Vancouver, January 18th to 22nd. San Diego, January 22nd to 27th. And the rest is to be written. Elisa was planning a meandering vacation, a West Coast tour from Canada to Southern California. Ultimately, it's impossible to know exactly how many places Elisa was going to visit on her West Coast tour, but she makes mention of considering San Diego, Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo, Santa Cruz, San Jose, and San Francisco. One gets the impression that this vacation was also a journey of self-discovery, and possibly of personal recovery. But unfortunately, that recovery never happened. Los Angeles would end up being the last stop on her journey, and the very last place anyone would ever see her alive. On January 22nd, 2013, while just beginning her journey to the West Coast, Elisa Lam missed her connecting flight. Of the slight delay, she wrote, I got lost in the airport. Oh well, it could be worse. United Airlines provides blankets. It's a lot comfier than Ottawa for sure. Eventually, Elisa would make good on her first intended destination. On January 24th, she wrote, Today I slept, took a long hot shower, stuffed myself silly with a $3 dinner. It has been most productive and enjoyable. I seriously have done nothing in San Diego that is out of my normal routine at home. After spending some necessary time acclimatizing to her new surroundings, she wrote, Okay, okay, enough of the house planting. It's time to get down to business. Now that I'm rested and well, starting tomorrow, I should venture outside more. According to a high school classmate, Alex Ristea, Elisa decided to go to California for a holiday, and she posted photos on Facebook of herself at the San Diego Zoo. Two days later, she mentions a desire to go out that night and listen to jazz music. The next day, Elisa wrote about having a wonderful time at a Prohibition-themed bar, but her mood was soured a little bit because that night she lost the BlackBerry cell phone she was semi-permanently borrowing from a friend. On January 29th, Elisa wrote from Los Angeles, I have arrived in La La Land, and there is a monstrosity of a building next to the place I'm staying. The place in which Elisa was staying was the Cecil Hotel. wherein she mentions arriving in LA is the last personal entry Elisa wrote on her Tumblr. It's not the last reblog on her feed, those she continued for a while longer, but Elisa never typed with her own fingers another personal entry about her life and her West Coast tour. This means that the last unfiltered view of her world was from the Cecil Hotel. And if you have heard anything about Elisa Lam, you've likely heard it in conjunction with the Cecil. What would happen to her there would shake Los Angeles to its core and make headlines around the world. The entire time Elisa was away from home, she called her family to check in. Despite not being registered for classes with the University of British Columbia that year, it's clear that Elisa still valued her ties with home. Katie Orphan, manager of a bookshop close to the hotel called The Last Bookstore, stated that Elisa came into the somewhat famous bookstore while she was in Los Angeles. Elisa wanted to buy some books and music for her family, but was worried that the gifts might not fit into her luggage. Orphan said, It seemed like she had plans to return home, plans to give things to her family members in Vancouver and reconnect with them. Unfortunately, those plans to reconnect with her family would never come to fruition. On January 31st, 2013, Elisa Lam just disappeared. That day, Elisa did not call her family to check in, like she did every day. When they were unable to establish contact with Elisa, her parents reported her missing on February 4th. Shortly thereafter, David and Yena Lam, along with Elisa's sister, flew out to Los Angeles to find answers, and hopefully find Elisa. But before Elisa vanished, things happened at the Cecil Hotel, things that need to be discussed. 
When Elisa first checked into the Cecil Hotel on January 28, 2013, she was assigned a shared room with other hotel guests on the fifth floor. Roughly two days into her residency at the Cecil, Elisa's roommates complained to hotel staff about, quote, certain odd behavior that she was exhibiting, and as a result, Elisa was moved to her own room on the same floor. This would have been around the 30th or 31st of January, perhaps the very day that Elisa failed to check in with her family. And on February 1st, Elisa Lam stepped into an elevator in the Cecil Hotel, just days before she was reported missing. The exact date of February 1st may be up for debate, as other sources say that she was last seen the previous day. Casting further doubt on the matter is the fact that the NBC Los Angeles webpage hyperlink establishing her as having been in the elevator on the 1st gives her the name Elisa Lame. Perhaps that's just an unfortunate side effect of how hyperlinking works, but it's also possible that that's an unprofessional mistake on the part of NBC Los Angeles. Or, even more likely, perhaps I'm just being a petty asshole about it. Regardless, Elisa stepped into an elevator at the Cecil Hotel, and the security camera inside the car captured her in a moment that she arguably never would have wanted to be recorded. The following is the most professional way I have of describing what took place in the elevator surveillance video. It appears as if Elisa Lam is experiencing a break from reality. I believe that Elisa Lam's mental state was abnormal when she walked into that elevator. The video itself is grainy, and the timestamp is blurred, but the actual events of the video are clear and inherently disturbing. Elisa stepped into the elevator car and pressed multiple buttons for different floors on the control panel. The numbers lit up, but the doors remained open. Elisa stepped toward the open door, leaned her body out of the car, quickly looked right and left, and then stepped back into the elevator. She backed up to the right-hand wall and then edged herself into the corner, still facing the doorway. It looked as if she was expecting someone, but nobody else was there. She cautiously stepped toward the still-open elevator door and then stood in the threshold for a moment. She placed one foot outside the elevator, leaned out of it, and then hopped with both feet into the hallway. She sidled to the left and then stepped backwards into the elevator car and then stepped back out of the elevator car again. She sidestepped to the left and exited the frame. Her right arm re-entered the frame and seemed to come to rest on her head. She turned and stepped back into the elevator, bracing herself on the door frame. She bent down and pressed the same buttons as before, only multiple times, but then she left the elevator again. She waved her hands before her, fingers splayed as if she were trying to find something, or was gesturing to some unknown person. She made more gestures, closer to her body, and then walked away from the elevator, completely out of frame. A long moment passed, and then the elevator door closed. It opened again, and then the scene shook a bit as the door began to close again, as if some internal mechanism had reset. From there, it appeared as if the elevator finally began moving on the journey Elisa had input, but she was not seen on camera again. To say that her behavior in that car was out of the ordinary would be putting it quite mildly. This is the one primary source I won't be linking to in the episode script because, well, I just can't find the original video upload. It may have been taken down in the time since it was first disseminated. However, as things tend to live forever on the internet, a simple search will lead you to a number of iterations of the video. But Elisa's behavior in the surveillance footage was in no way normal. She moved and acted in a way that suggested she was not in her right frame of mind. Not at all. And that's the point I want to drive home regarding the video. That Elisa Lam was, most likely, experiencing some kind of mental distress event. Whether it was anxiety, or something to do with her depressive tendencies, or something else entirely, I cannot say. Elisa had already made plain that she suffered from bipolar depression. She talked about it openly on her Tumblr, so perhaps this was a particular manifestation of her attenuated mental state. In the end, we'll never know exactly what was happening to Elisa that day. Three days after she was captured on camera going through an extremely distressful event, Elisa Lam was reported missing by her family, and the next day, the LAPD began to search for her. Given her status as a Canadian tourist and a foreign national, special attention was paid by law enforcement to finding her. A command center was established in the lobby of the Cecil Hotel, undoubtedly due to the bizarre nature of the elevator footage. A number of search teams were put together, 
each one paired with an employee who had access to a master hotel key. The hotel was searched top to bottom, including the roof, but no sign of Elisa was found. Even a second search, which included the utilization of canine units, turned up nothing. I can't imagine what her family must have been going through. The turmoil they undoubtedly felt while they waited for... something. For anything. They would have to wait an agonizing 14 days before Elisa was eventually found. On February 11, 2013, the Los Angeles Police Department released a community alert notification listing Elisa Lam as a missing person. The document looked like a flyer and read, Elisa Lam was last seen on January 31, 2013 at the Cecil Hotel at 640 South Main Street in downtown Los Angeles. Lam was traveling alone from Vancouver, Canada and arrived in Los Angeles, California on January 26, 2013. Her final destination was Santa Cruz, California. She takes public transportation, including Amtrak and buses. Elisa was described as female, Chinese, Canadian, black hair, brown eyes, 5'4", 115 pounds, DOB 43091. The document noted that Elisa possibly suffers from mild depression, which seems like a vast understatement of what was actually going on. On the other hand, that reduction may have been intended to minimize the mental health difficulties she was going through, and thus better facilitate contact by strangers who might see her. But perhaps I'm grasping at straws with that one. On the 19th of February, Santiago Lopez, a maintenance employee of the Cecil Hotel, was dispatched to the roof to address the complaints of a guest, who stated that the water pressure in their shower was not adequate, and that the shower was producing an odd smell. After deactivating the alarm on the roof access door, Santiago stepped out onto the open-air roof and went to examine the hotel's water tanks. About four feet above the roof of the Cecil Hotel stood a large platform, on top of which were four 1,000-gallon water tanks, each one roughly ten feet high and six feet in diameter. A heavy metal lid was atop each water tank, with an access hatch 18 inches square. Santiago climbed up onto the platform and ascended a ladder attached to the main water tank. It was then that he saw the access hatch was open. He looked inside the water tank and made perhaps the most horrifying discovery of his life. Floating face up, naked and horribly marbled, was the body of Elisa Lam. Santiago Lopez took out a walkie-talkie and informed Pedro Tovar, his supervisor, of what he had discovered. Back in the hotel, they notified Amy Price, the general manager of the Cecil, and then they called 911. The Los Angeles Fire Department responded to the call and arrived at the hotel less than half an hour later. Elisa's clothing, shoes, and wristwatch were in the water with her, though she wasn't wearing them. Because of her location within the 1,000-gallon water tank, the L.A. Fire Department had to cut a hole in the bottom of the tank in order to extract her body and belongings. From there, her remains were taken to the Hertzberg Davis Forensic Science Center, part of CSU Los Angeles, where she was examined in the hopes that it might provide some answers. The autopsy examination of Elisa Lam was assigned case number 2013-01364. Associate Deputy Medical Examiner Jason P. Tovar performed the autopsy, which was witnessed by LAPD detectives Wallace Tunnell and Stearns. The opening of the examination document reads, The body is identified by toe tags and is that of an unembalmed refrigerated adult female Asian who is in moderate decomposition. She appears to give an age of 21 years. The body weighs 121 pounds, measures 66 inches, and is thin. Her clothing is described as one pair of black shorts, men's medium, one green shirt labeled JJM size large, one pair of black underwear, one pair of black polka dot sandals, one red sweatshirt. All of the items had sand-like particulate attached to the fabric and loosely present in the fold of the clothes. The autopsy report exhaustively details the manner in which Elisa's remains were examined. And in relation to the gastrointestinal tract, Tovar writes, The esophagus is intact throughout. The stomach is not distended. It contains scant red fluid. Portions of tablets and capsules cannot be discerned in the stomach. And further down, the report states, A complete autopsy examination showed no evidence of trauma, and toxicology studies did not show acute alcohol or drug intoxication. 
decedent had a history of bipolar disorder for which she was prescribed medication. Toxicology studies were performed for the presence of these drugs. However, quantitation in the blood was not performed due to limited sample availability. Therefore, interpretation is limited. Police investigation did not show evidence of foul play. The autopsy report provides answers to some questions, but not to one in particular. Perhaps the most important question. How the fuck did Elisa Lam end up in a water tank on the roof of the Cecil Hotel? We're going to step into the realm of conjecture for a little bit, but I think it's important, especially when discussing issues of mental health. In addition to the state of her remains, the autopsy report, publicly posted to Medium.com by writer Josh Dean, lists five different prescription medications that Elisa Lam was prescribed, as well as various over-the-counter medications in her possession. She had prescriptions for Lamotrigine, quetiapine fumarate, venlafaxine hydrochloride XR, in both 75 and 150 mg dosages, and Welbutrin XL. Both lamotrigine and quetiapine fumarate can be used to treat bipolar disorder, while venlafaxine hydrochloride XR and brand name Welbutrin XL can be used to treat major depressive disorder. Both of these conditions Elisa freely admitted to suffering from. However, there was also another prescription-only medication in her possession, one that she did not seem to actually have a prescription for, brand name Dexedrine Spansule, an amphetamine-based medication commonly used to treat attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. If you're a little bit confused, I don't blame you. As far as I can tell, Elisa Lam did not suffer from ADHD. A quick control f search of the most recent posts on her Tumblr reveals that none of them contain the words attention or disorder. So, why would she have medication for that? Perhaps more to the point, why would she have medication that is specifically not to be taken with some of the other medications she was on? Venlafaxine hydrochloride XR is classified as an extended-release serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, or SNRI. These kinds of medications are intended to prevent the reuptake, or reabsorption, of serotonin and norepinephrine by the part of the brain that initially created them. This reabsorption prevention leads to elevated levels of those two neurotransmitters in the brain, which leads to a lessening of depression symptoms. But in perhaps the most tragically ironic twist of all time, antidepressant medications, including venlafaxine hydrochloride XR, carry the risk of actually increasing suicidal thoughts or behaviors as a possible side effect of taking them. This matters for Elisa, not only because she was prescribed an SNRI antidepressant medication, but also because the dexedrine spansule ADHD medication she had, if taken with SNRIs, can increase the risk of something called serotonin syndrome, which can cause delirium, confusion, and drastic changes in one's mental state. Serotonin syndrome can kill. It's worth noting that the autopsy report failed to detect the presence of amphetamines in her blood, but that does not mean that she never took medications like the Dexeter and Spansule capsules she had, and medications like this, in my opinion, should not be taken without even the barest understanding of the possible side effects of them, or ramifications of taking them in combination with other prescription medications. There's a reason that drugs like this have to be prescribed to you by a qualified doctor they can, quite literally, change the chemistry of your brain. That's not something to be taken lightly. And perhaps that's what happened. Perhaps the state of Elisa's mind had changed so drastically, so suddenly, that she did something as out of character as climbing into a giant water tank on the roof of the hotel in which she was staying. Elisa was clearly not in her right state of mind, and... Maybe it had something to do with what she may or may not have been taking. I do not know if that's the case, but it certainly seems like a hell of a coincidence. I'm not saying don't take medications, and I'm certainly not saying that Elisa Lam messed around with her prescription medications. That would be an extremely unprofessional assumption on my part. What I am saying is that if you have been prescribed antidepressant drugs, the reason is because the qualified medical professional who prescribed them to you genuinely thought that they would improve the quality of your life. And if you wish to stop taking them, 
If you have doubts or uncertainties about how they make you feel, please, I beg you, talk to your doctor first. After all, they went to medical school, possibly for more than eight years, in order to do what they do. The drugs you were given were not given to you thoughtlessly. They are intended to make you happy again, even if just for a moment. And we all want to be happy, don't we? No one knows better than I just how excruciatingly long it took to write this piece. Upon reflection, part of the reason for the delay was that the best way to come to know Elisa was to examine what she put on Nouvelle Nouveau. She and I never spoke person to person, and we certainly weren't friends in real life, but she chose to express a part of herself on her Tumblr, as do I. It's possible that you do as well. But the more I delved into Elisa's Tumblr, the more lost I became. It's not that what she wrote and reposted was confusing, it's that it seemed arrogant to think that you can truly know every facet of someone by their internet presence. There was just so much person here. She was depressed, hopeful, cynical, driven, an insomniac, a lover of art, a hater of retail. She thought about suicide. She thought even more about the wonders of life and how it is worth living. She was everyone, and yet she was like no one else. I can't say with any certainty that I definitively know who Elisa Lam was, but it's clear to me, now more than ever, that she was so much more than just the girl in the water tank. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is 1-800-273-8255. Call them if you need to. There's no shame in it. Be kind to each other. We are all we have. City of Sunsets is researched, written, and recorded by me, Luis Lopez. I ended up with more than 50 sources for this episode, so when I say researched, that is the truth. You can find my complete list of sources for this episode in the show notes, as well as in the full episode script, which is available for download on my Patreon. If you were able to get your hands on the first episode script, you'll see that it did not contain in-text citations for my sources. That has been fixed for this episode, so feel free to look up each claim in situ. And speaking of my Patreon, if you would like to support the production of my writing, that really is the best way. It helps me to produce more creative writing pieces, both fiction and nonfiction, including the next episode of City of Sunsets, which is part two of the story of Elisa Lam. Thank you for listening. <laughs>